Dr. Agberg, my friend. Hello, Frank. Hello, Gene. We go back to the old country together. <laughs> you know it. Okay, got to have the uh, pen. Got to have the pen. Similar ancestry. <laughs> I know. You know it. <laughs> nice to see you, Frank, as always. Thanks. So what do you think of uh, uh, this podcast, Brain, Hope, Reality? You, you know, Gene, I couldn't have imagined that we would get to this point. And thank you so much for being an international leader. It's my it, honor. It, it, it truly is my honor. Yes. So what do, what do you think of this? PTSI, not PTSD. What do you think? I, I think that's fine. Although, are we on? Are we recording now? Yeah, recording. We can always chop it up later. No. Um, I could see how the Diagnostic and statistic, Statistical Manual right. could allow either. And they've done it before in other instances. But for us, we really know why the word injury is, right. is a is a good thing. It matters to the people who carry the diagnosis. And they've told us this. And, and Gene, you've done the research to prove that most want it, men and women both. Yes. hundred percent. So if, if I may, let, let me do the more formal introduction. Okay. And then the, the, uh, I, I have one big question I want to ask and then we can check. Okay. So this is my amazing friend, Dr. Frank Gagbert, I've known him for a number of years, and he introduced me to the term PTSI. So keep in mind, I am not a psychiatrist by any measure, as you said on one of your podcasts when you talked about Stella Giglia block. Uh, but physiological model makes a lot of sense to me. And I think separating the brain from the body is really not possible. And I think it's pretty clear. So the question I have for you, number one reason I wanted to have you on, besides many things, so it's catching up is amazing, uh, is when, so basically, let me just say what I, I, I know, and then maybe you can tell me. So you have been working in trauma for many years, obviously, and you did some work with FBI. It's when you came up with the term Stockholm Syndrome. And then you were part of the committee that worked on PTSD assignment in 1980 when DSM-3 was conceived. Is that fair? Well, I was on the subsequent committees, but okay. at that point, at that very point, I, I was the policy lead for the National Institute of Mental Health. Right. So I was engaged through that function rather than on technically the DSM-3 committee, but I was on the DSM-3R committee and, and I was bringing... Um, whatever we want to call it, the influence, the attitude, the concerns of the National Institute of Mental Health right. to the process. Right. Exactly. Uh, from the earliest days. Right. It's interesting. I, I actually developed a pretty close relationship with Dr. Insel later on. I'll oh, tell you good. a good story about Tom Insel. Yeah. Uh, but what what do you think was the first year which you start really conceiving term PTSI? I'm going to move so you can actually see that term. Uh, I believe it was in concert with Jonathan Shea and with General Corelli. Right. Uh, so basically, so and, you guys came up with that concept, you think? I, I, I think we did, yes. First, General Corelli sought an audience uh, with the American Psychiatric Association because he knew that his soldiers did not like the idea of being called disordered. And what, what year was that, do you think? <sighs> was that 2009, I, you think? 2010? About. I, I, I'm not sure, and, I, and I'd rather not state without, no, no, okay. without having the facts before and, and I'll me. Tell you, I'll, I'll tell you what I do know, is that 2012, yes. uh, I think you and... General Picciarelli went to the APA trying to change their minds about the name change. And I, I read the yes. article about that from PBS. Yes. So what I, I would like, you're, you're like a real psychiatrist, which, as you know, I'm not even close. I'm a real psychiatrist, yes. 
Could, could you just explain to me your rationale in your own words? Because this is, this is still your baby. I'm just trying to carry your baby a little further along. But what you, you have explained to me, well, I just don't totally understand that. So the stigmatizing model of disorder versus the injury, could you expand on that? That would be amazing. Well, to be disordered or to have a name of a, of a disease like schizophrenia that has picked up a certain amount of negative connotation uh, does make people who bear that particular label and those who care about them uh, want to deny it and sometimes avoid treatment. Because it implies that you're crazy, or or it implies that you're making things up. It's it's in your mind and it's not real. Right. But very much thanks to you, you're not the only one, Gene, Doctor Lippa. You're not the only one, but others. You told me, Gene, you've known me too many years, and then you yes. know, doctors, and, right? and for this audience, I think we all want to be on a first name basis. I agree. This is meant to be conversational, right? This is not meant to be yes. like science. Yes. Uh, words matter, and there are times when racial minorities have said, we want to change the name. We don't want to be called uh, Black. We want to be called African American. Right. Times change. Attitudes change. And in my field, I, I when I was a little boy, I never imagined I would grow up then I would spend so much a part of my life dealing not just with human tragedy and loss, but with the worst kinds of losses that involve sometimes encounters with evil people, with sadistic people. Right. There are people who are beaten or humiliated or left for dead. It happens to men and women. The sexual part of the abuse is is part of people who are sadistic and psychopathics desire to dehumanize us. And, and in doing so, some of them feel that they have gained power and authority and prestige. They laugh at us. And, and when I have dealt as a doctor and as a clinician and as a psychiatrist with women who come from American minority groups, many of them told me, that, that the greatest burden to bear was my gender rather than my race or, or my ethnicity. Right. I believe there is something in our species that permits us and at times rewards us for being not just aggressive, but frightening and right. bestial. Well, look, I love the term bestial. Yes, you're in the business and I'm in the business of the healing arts. We we want to make people better. And and we also subscribe uh to general uh health, public health. We want we want people to understand that we have a collective investment in being human and in being kind to one another. If we're very religious, it means earning what we believe is our deity's intention for us, which is not for us to destroy and diminish human beings. It's, it's to bring all of us to our, our full potential. And, and I think at the basis, it's kindness is such a part of it. You and I come from a religious group, too, right. whether we're strongly in practicing it or not. But for some reason, the Jewish religion has been chosen by others at times uh, to suffer and, and to be compared uh, to insects and and to animals. I, I, yeah, so, I, I've so, thought about that. Yeah. I've thought about yeah. that a lot, actually. So actually, before we get into it, I'd, love to, I'd like to tell you my physiological perspective on that and neuro neurobiological sure, perspective. Sure. Sure. But let's, let's finish talking about the, uh, the term injury. So, well, in, in injury is used in the military to confer honor. We have medals 
for going to battle, for fighting for your Purple country. Heart. Purple Heart. Yeah, for being wounded right. uh, and, and, and surviving. And we also grant veterans privileges to be cared for by specialists, special places who, who know how to help us recover from our wounds with, with collaboration from others, with, with dignity, and with honor. So you are now one of the worldwide leaders in this fight. I met a man named Tom Mahaney, who is a bricklayer and a veteran of Vietnam. And uh, his comrade is working with him, a man named Kent Hall, who not only suffered, but decided that he wanted to commit suicide by cop. So he robbed a bank and he got caught and he spent time in prison. And now he's an elected official. He's a leader in the community. Uh, we're, we're doing creative things to try to create a national monument dedicated to those who have gone through this change, this injury, and then this glorious recovery of finding one another and finding honor. So this is all about honor rather than stigma for doing what you do as a human being, for suffering, for surviving, and for being part of humanity. Let me ask another question. Do you remember how you met uh, Pete Shirelli? I'm just curious to see that history. Uh, I have met him in person. I met him on, on a few occasions, uh, but I don't remember the first time. It's okay. I, I know that he once admonished me, and I can't remember what I did that was wrong. I think I, I, think I said something about his mentor, who was the head of the VA, uh, anyway, I, I, I hold that man in very, very oh, high esteem. And I, I know that he figured out uh, when, when he was uh, really the second ranking general in the United States Army, uh, he, he approached organized psychiatry and said, please change the name to injury. Yeah. So. And so let me ask you one last question along that. So I wrote the PBS yes. accounting of that. It was very interesting. Yes. So, um, so my understanding of that is the executive, the president of APA at that time was willing to change PTSD to PTSI for the military personnel, but not for civilians. While uh, no, 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 I, I don't no. think he was willing to change the now? name uh, f for anybody. He, he, he never agreed to do what would have been simple, to have allowed either name to be used for the exact same entity. Right. And I pointed that out to the directors of the American Psychiatric Association, right. that we had other instances where we allowed the doctor and the patient to choose the name for the exact same thing. Can you give me an example of that? Uh, do you remember what, I, what term that I was? I can't remember the one right now. Okay. Uh, I, I, I had examples at the time. No, don't, don't worry uh, about it. And just, then, so, just so everybody knows, I, I am now in Key Largo. I am retired from officially being a, uh, a licensed physician in the state, the various states where I was licensed. Uh, but I am still a professor in the field. And I teach and I advocate. And I appreciate it. So last question along those lines, and I, I think I'd like to have kind of other discussion. But yes. I, when I read the the, uh, the the person who finally made the, put the kibosh, so to speak, or stopped the whole churn progression of PTSD yeah. to PTSI was the CEO of APA, from what I understand. I didn't quite understand his logic. Do you remember his logic? Or I, I didn't go down well, I, I think I think one I think one of the leaders, who's a personal friend of mine, uh, Matt Friedman. Uh, yeah, that's what, was, it was. that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, and and Dr. Matt Friedman, an MD, PhD, very learned and distinguished and and kind man, uh, felt that the term disorder went along with 
so many other terms, uh, so many other t- times that disorder was used, and and he felt it was not stigmatizing, and he had support within his colleague group, so right. he didn't see the need for the change. I think he, some people also believe that if you change the name from disorder to injury, some insurance companies might cut back on their benefits. So they thought they were doing the veteran a favor right. by maintaining the name. And and I wrote a piece that, that was in military medicine, and I, I offered the arguments against this. That piece is still available. I'm going to look it up. And yes. Yeah. So, so the interesting part to me is I had this argument yesterday on LinkedIn uh-huh. with the man who is a fire chief in one of the big cities. So yes. he was saying insurance is not going to cover it. So to be clear, what you talked about is changing the name, but not you're not going to change PSL-4 or PSL-5, uh, which is a diagnostic kind of self-assessment questionnaire. So to me, I don't understand why insurance would have an issue with that. But here's what I told them. So it's very clear what stigma produces suicides, or it leads to lack of care. I don't think there is any doubt of that. There's multiple papers saying that. So here's my response to him. And he said, I'm curious what you think of it. I said, let's say we overdose, overdiagnose PTSI. People see too many psychiatric professionals. Let's say we do that. Let's assume worst case scenario. Right? Are you willing to allow people to underdiagnose people who have severe PTSI and not seek care and commit suicide because you're afraid that the other people are not gonna will seek too much care? I, I think that's a rational argument. And he said, you know, that's a good point. The other part, being afraid insurance doesn't cover it. You know, who's in charge of insurance? You can just say, you know, if PCL5 is above 35, which is, I think, standard cutoff, there you go. That, that's your PTSD, PTSI, whatever term you want to use, both terms, if you want to, it doesn't matter really. But I, I think that part, that argument is becoming less and less weak. The other part that you don't know, something new and different, is that we are about to do a survey of all the psychiatrists I can get to, what they mm-hmm. think about, do they agree strongly or mildly or disagree strongly or mildly with the name PTS, change the name PTSD to PTSI. Do they agree with that statement or not? We're about to conduct a large survey and I'll keep you in the loop, of course, about that. Data is data and we'll publish the data, whichever way it falls. Well, you, you also know what has happened in the state houses around the United States. And this is largely thanks uh, to Tom Mahaney and Honor for All. They have talked directly with the political leaders in the states, and, and all the states have a National Awareness Day. And they have changed the title by law in these states from PTSD Awareness Day to PTSI Awareness Day. Yeah, just happened and state of Illinois. We have ceremonies June. at state capitals, and I've had them. I like that I've had them with Democratic senators and Republican senators, many of whom have served, but also there are women who want to come up and participate in this. Uh, women more than men end up with a diagnosis. And it's not just because women are more often uh, assaulted domestically. I think it's because the female brain has more capacity to be sensitive and sympathetic and to feel the hurt. And the male brain uh, moves quickly to moderating feelings through behaviors, and they include substance abuse. 
but we're, we're doing research on all of these elements now, and we're, we're getting to the point where we have fact rather than impression or personal conviction that's not based on fact. The science in this field is growing enormously. And Jean, let's, let's turn to your contribution. You have discovered that you can use a, a device that a surgeon or an anesthesiologist understands to take away some of the connection between the brain and the organs of the body. When people say, I feel something in my gut, they literally are feeling things in their gut. Guts mm -hmm. react. Why do they react? Because impressions in the brain and in the mind are connected to the viscera, mm -hmm. the guts. Yep. And, and you know how to turn that off safely for a brief period of time. You have freed the body from the brain and the brain from the body, and it reboots. And now that we're doing this with our computers, we understand it in a uh, metaphorical way. And you, I just saw one of your patients give a brilliant explanation of being cleared from a condition that he had and he thought he would never be freed of. So, so thanks to you, you, you have done it. Uh, I think some of the people yeah, nice. in my field are suspicious. Uh, we, we don't know who Lipoff is and what is he doing? And can he do it better than we can? We've studied psychoanalysis. And when we have someone in psychoanalysis, they are with us for seven years and sometimes five days a week. I don't want to put down the psychoanalyst. They have discovered a lot of important facts about our species. But we can't do psychoanalysis for everybody who's traumatized. And, no. and I, I think plus you, you're doing something that is not stigmatized, it's rapid, and it works. Thank you. And the compliance is high. I mean, that's one of the things yes. that, I, you know, yes. I don't think I'm not that patient. I just, I don't think I can, I could wait five years. I'm not yeah. that good at that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's, well, let, let me get, let me run an interesting idea by you. So you were talking yes. about, I've looked at women and PTSD associated with being a female. Yes. It turns out if he, there's a few studies I could find is that if you control for the trauma type and women and men have the same trauma, not sexual trauma, not yes. so the yes. same trauma, yes. women have twice the chance of developing PTSD. Yes. Right. So let me tell you my, my thinking about it, which is going to be a totally odd thing. Okay. Okay. Everything I looked at is sympathetic system. I consider myself a sympathetic system expert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So published a few articles and I know something about it. Anyway, so before I got into the PTSD ward, I was treating half flushes. Mm -hmm. So stellate works very well on half flushes. So mm -hmm. at that time, I looked at estrogen. So as women age, estrogen goes down. That blood pressure goes up. Mm -hmm. If that happens, you put back estrogen blood pressure goes down again. Uh -huh. So I believe estrogen is a natural sympathetic or something that reduces uh -huh. sympathetic. And women have an increased sympathetic tone compared to the man. Uh -huh. So if that's true, the same trauma should activate more sympathetics in a female versus male. What do you think? It makes sense to me. Maybe. It makes sense to me, but but at the same time, that uh, I I oversimplify it. I, I will say to someone, you uh, are a sensitive person. Now, that could also mean that you have the physiology and the neurochemistry of a certain kind of sensitivity, and, and then I'll say, but sensitivity is a blessing and a curse. It makes you more aware of things. It could make you, in a way, more intuitive, but you have to manage it because sensitivity can uh, be a difficulty. It and can destroy it, you. Yes. And, and you can be like a fine violin, a, a Stradivarius, but it takes a good violinist to play a fine violin. These violins are a little more temperamental. They get out of tune. 
Uh, for the guy, I'll say you're uh, you're like a Porsche, or you're you're like a Maserati. You're you're a fine tuned, elegant racing car, but you got to be a darn good driver to know how to how to handle it. Exactly. And, Gene, I think I think we are discovering the same thing from different angles. Right. Uh, and a, a number of our mutual friends have thought, well, is Lipoff doing something that is just making people feel good temporarily? And in the beginning, remember, you had to do the stellate ganglion block several times. Right. When somebody felt good, then felt bad, you would give them another shot. I was thinking, no, it's as soon as they feel good enough, let's add everything that we know about to enhance a person's abilities. <laughs> Sometimes, now that they're feeling temporarily better, it's a good time for the artist to paint again and then be proud of her painting. Right. Or for the craftsman, or or for the person who knows how to work on an oil rig. Anyway, there, there's there are strategies that those of us who are successful clinicians understand to get individual patients back to work. Uh, and some of us are better than others at understanding that we're not we're not telling everybody the same thing. We listen. One of the things, Gene, that I've learned to do is to ask someone who is my student or my patient or my mentee, who who gets you? Who in your life <laughs> understands you? It's a big question. They may have to think about it, and then they'll tell me. And as they're telling me, I'm listening and I'm learning, and I'm telling myself, I want to be that kind of a person. I want I want them not just to think, but to know that I understand them. And that means I'm not going to rather quickly tell them what to do. Uh, it, right. You want to be seen, right? You, you don't want to be ignored. You want to be seen. Well, I, I, I want to understand who understands them and why. Um, I may even want to get in touch with that person. Oh, when I'm working as a clinician with someone who has serious post-traumatic stress disorder, lately they've been journalists who go to war zones and put themselves in great danger, but they have such a calling to be there and to fully understand what's going on. And the journalist is, is often very sensitive. Some are insensitive. Some have thick skins, and they wouldn't call themselves sensitive, but many of them are sensitive, and they're a decade or two behind the police and the military and the firefighters in developing individual and group mechanisms for handling their secondary traumatic stress. Let me ask another so, crazy question. So uh, yesterday, I talked to a fire chief who, yeah. said, who said that all of the trauma made him basically insensate. He could care less if somebody jumped off the uh -huh. building or didn't, whatever. Uh -huh. Then I also talked to a special forces man who yeah. told me that until the block, he did not feel connected to his wife. After the block, he got connected. Yeah. The fire chief felt empathy again. Uh-huh. Uh, From your perspective, actually, I looked up some fascinating stuff. I'm going to start writing about it. What, good, what do you, how does trauma kill empathy, you think? Well, well I, I think we, we know through common sense and through human experience that some people do get toughened and hardened. They are, they are not made sensitive to themselves. And they're sometimes very hard to live with because they can be, they can be seen as indifferent, as unloving, uh, as, if not bullies, uh, hard and, right. and aloof. Right. And, and, and some of them will feel better when they recover. Uh, some men would call it 
their uh, their their feminine side and and not feel that they are any less masculine because they're in touch with this other part. And uh, I, I've certainly known women who've been hardened uh, and and not really wanting to come close to a a memory of something that they have suppressed because it was so strong and and uh, diminishing at, at the time. I, I've thought of the difference between shame and guilt, and many people have written about that. I, I think shame is the feeling that we have as we're lowered in dominance. We have a certain place in a pecking order or in the human group. Right. Something happens, and inside we feel less able, less worthy, of participation in that group, where we're excluded. I, I, I've also been interested in primates. I, I've studied chimps in East and West Africa and uh, orangutans in Borneo, and our, our our closest simian cousins show some similarities. And it's it's also very dangerous for an alpha chimp to lose alpha status, they, they then are driven out of the family. Yes, and we see it in politics too. Uh, lose your privileged place as the alpha politically or in an organization, and you can be ripped mm. to shreds. Never thought of it that way. Anyway, Frank, I, I took tons of your time. Um, we usually do only 30 minutes because I think people have a limited attention span, <laughs> yes, including yes. me. Anyway, I, I just yeah. wanted to thank you so much for everything you've done for psychiatry and everything you've done. And it's an absolute honor to follow in your footsteps. There are some big footsteps. Thank you, Gene. And, and, and if I can have one word for those who of do course. pay attention to this, it's, it's, it's never too late to do what you can for the people and the issues that you believe in. Uh, I'm right. sometimes dealing with people who are literally a month away from dying and they still have an opportunity to help others, including me, who's helping them by giving That's me why hope a chance. Is so important, wouldn't you agree? That's right. A chance to have hope and, and a chance to be a significant part of our species. Exactly. Let's stay alive. <laughs> Thank you. I'll talk to you soon, my friend. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye now. Bye